Hello, everybody. Welcome to Three Point Perspective, the podcast about illustration, how to do it, how to make a living at it, and how to make an impact in the world with your art. I'm Jake Parker. I'm Samantha Cotterell. And I'm Anthony Wheeler. All three of us are professional illustrators, and for the last 25 years, we've worked with every major publisher and publication in the business. We've all taught illustration as well. Each week, we tackle a subject related to illustration from three perspectives. Sometimes we agree, sometimes we argue, but every time you learn something brand spanking new, bucket list moment. <laughs> <laughs> well, you had to say the spanking new part, man. I do. I'm sorry. I've been wanting to I say it along with you for how many episodes? <laughs> this is like a moment, you know? <laughs> very That's cool. Right. Very cool. Somewhere, somewhere Lee is smiling very profoundly. <laughs> right. That, that you added nice. it in there. <laughs> so we have, we're trying something new here with the podcast, and we thought we would uh, bring in a couple of uh, guests, uh, hosts to the to the show. And uh, so these people are no strangers to the podcast. We've had Samantha Cotterell on a couple times now. She's active in the YouTube comments, and Anthony's filled in for Lee or Will or me at one time or the other. Over the over the years, what how many episodes have you done with this? I don't know, probably six or seven. Yeah, yeah, and this will be your third episode, Sam. So yep. glad to have you guys here. The whole purpose of this is, you know, we, uh, me, Will, and Lee just were, have been talking. Like, what if we brought in some new guests, or not guests, but some new hosts every now and again to see. Uh, essentially to lighten the load of doing the podcast, but also to like freshen the podcast up a little bit and kind of get some different perspectives and some, some new perspectives. So. Some new arguments. Some new arguments. Yeah. yeah. So that I really, people might think that, that Lee and Will are just at each other's throats all the time. <laughs> <laughs> it is not like that at all. Uh, anyway, so glad to have you guys here. So glad you could make time for this. Tell us what you guys are all working on right now. Go, You go first, Anthony. Uh, I am working on being very tired from a 10-day road trip to the coast of Oregon. Uh, so I just got home uh, literally hours ago. So if I sound really exhausted and tired, it's because I have three children and I've, <laughs> I've, I've been in a car for three days. Uh, beyond that, it, uh, exciting times around here. So we launched our chaotic draw along uh, prompt card deck a couple of months ago to the general public. Uh, so it's kind of like one part creative game, one part creative tool. Uh, sales of that have been super duper duper strong. Uh, so I've been really, really stoked about that. Uh, at the moment, once I get off this call today, I'm gonna wrangle up the team. We're working on my second art book. Uh, I hired a designer for this one. I designed uh, along with my friend Pablo uh, and another buddy named Joey, uh, our first art book five years ago and it turned out really great. Uh, but but hiring a hiring a, a designer who's got all the time in the world just to really focus on the thing has has taken and really lightened my load, and so we're about ninety percent done with that project, and then we're gonna throw it out on Kickstarter here in a month, I think. Um, so my second art book, and it's much it, the art book is much bigger, it's much more robust, and we're talking a lot more about kind of creativity and imagination and daydreaming and where ideas come from and. Uh, childhood and all that sort of stuff so how i'm really excited about it. it so that's the next big thing how many pages is it so the first one was 96 uh this one is 144 wow um yeah i had <laughs> I, just, I, just, I just draw too much um and it just felt like it, we could we could pack a ton on each page but also let it breathe a little bit more mm -hmm. um and so, and it was funny cobbling it together uh, because we have enough material for another 144 page uh, book number three. So if this one does well, I'll consider doing a third one, um, but we're about ready to start uh, working on a workbook for the chaotic draw along. Um, so, so people and kids can, can draw right inside of a book and have prompts kind of all built in and yeah. drawing starters and stuff like that. And then I really want to do a chaotic draw along art book. Um, because mm -hmm. there's just so much material. It's, it's fun. So this art book, let me just get a picture of it. It's, yeah. is it straight up like here's scans of my drawings in an art book or is it uh, more thematic? Like this is the, what, what was the theme of this childhood for this one? Yeah. Like, so yeah, 
I think the I think the overall theme, which the first book didn't really have a theme. The first mm-hmm. art book was just me putting my flag in the sand of like, I'm an illustrator. I quit my job two years ago. Yeah. I'm going to make an art book and I've arrived. Um, you know, and that thing did really well. I mean, we sold uh, we sold a lot of copies of it and I still have uh, have some left. This one, I would say the overall banner is, is just imagination. Like, where does mine come from? How do I harness it? How do I put it all together? Why does my childhood sort of affect the whole thing? Mm-hmm. Uh, I at first didn't want there to be kind of interior themes of the book, but as the designer really started to comb through and figure out all the all the work that he could put inside of it, he's like, man, there's just there's mo- there's a monster theme, and then there's a childhood theme, and then there's the theme of all your own original characters, and there's themes where where uh, or sections that could be really quiet, and there's other sections that deserve tons of explanation, and so. Yeah, it feels, I have the other book near me, um, but it feels similar, but really different. Mm-hmm. Uh, meaning there's just so many more words and, and much more of my personalities come through. Yeah. Um, I wanted to do this three years ago, uh, but with COVID and, and not you know doing Comic Cons and stuff like that, I just never felt like it was a, a good time, but now it's just perfect. Yeah, wow, cool. wow, you've been very productive. <laughs> Very. Not all the time. That's Not all the good. time. I still play Fortnite sometimes with my friends. So <laughs> that's very important too. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. Well, I guess I'll my turn. I've yeah. been. Oh my! But you might hear a little crying in the background. It is not a child, but a English bulldog that. <laughs> does not want to be separated from me right now. Um, I'll have to bring her out at the end to show you her. But anyway. Um, Okay. Put that, so, do- put that dog on your lap. Yeah, let's see. Everybody it. on YouTube wants to see that. Dog. People love uh, that. You'll dog. want to see the English bulldog. Let me try and sit. Oh, hold on. <laughs> this is really working well. Um, hold on, hold on. Yeah. We're, we're all we're all people who have uh, have always have people in the yes. background for these. Like, you'll see my, my all my kids will walk back and forth uh, mm-hmm. behind this. Oh, and yeah, at some yeah, point, yeah. seven-year-old Sullivan will just press his entire face against this window <laughs> just to see what I'm doing. So, okay, I've let her in. I think just visual. So anyway, yeah. um, here I'll I'll show you. Okay. Let's give a little introduction and then. What's the, What's the dog's name? Her name is Noki. Noki. That is oh a goodness. solid puppy. That she, is an English bulldog. It like is. 100%. <laughs> oh my goodness. So that's Noki. Um, she's made her way into the next book that I just finished. So she's mm. she might be the. I wonder if she'll be the star of the book that was just completed. But um, as for where I am, wait. Oh, question: Did you get an English bulldog because of your heritage? Is that <laughs> like was that the only option? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We had we had two English bulldogs when we were first married. Um, Twenty, uh, all thirty years ago, I guess. Mm-hmm. And we always knew that we would go back to an English bulldog at some point mm-hmm. in our lives. And we did the thing where we had the golden retriever with the boys, and yeah. the golden retriever had a great life. And then um, when our golden retriever passed, we were like, okay, we're we're gonna take a break from pets for a bit. And then I think I lasted a week. <laughs> and I, was like, I need to have an animal back. <laughs> yeah, and there's just something about British bulldogs that have such personality and character and yeah. expression that it's like my uh, 19 year old would say is like once you go English bulldog, there's no turning back. Like, there's no you... turning back. That's <laughs> so, okay. and it's true. Um, <laughs> but okay, she had a fix. So sorry for that distraction. But it's not a distraction. The it, audience loves it. Yes. They do love those. Love um, in terms here. of work, I. Well, I recently just finished another collaborative book project. It's the follow-up to Thankful with Elaine Vickers, and this mm-hmm. one was titled Heartfelt. And I knew going into the completion, of, I know I had talked to you, um, Jake, I had talked to you about that before, that I was actually actively looking forward to not having anything inked and in the works after I finished, just to give myself a little time to breathe and figure stuff out because I think, um, as I'm sure many people have experienced a couple of years ago, we went through a family crisis and people have their own things and challenges and struggles. And because of that, those two books that I've recently done had to get pushed like six months, seven months Mm. in order to allow me to just really focus on the stuff at hand. And Mm. that's where the priority needed to go. So because of that, 
look, which I know we had talked about over the last podcast, that was pushed six months. So I got into that and that was a lot of work. That was like yeah. 3D on steroids. Yeah. <laughs> that really burned me out. And then mm. that ultimately pushed this last book out six months. And mm. the last, I would say, five to 10 images of heartfelt, my body was just saying, you need to take a break. You are burning out. Uh, you need to, you haven't had a moment to collect yourself from that initial crisis. You yeah. just went straight from crises to catch up. And near the end of that catching up, so to speak, it became very apparent that I hadn't given myself the time needed to rest and recover and just be. <laughs> so, yeah. so it was a little scary too, because I think yeah when you finish a book project and you want to have another project and you don't have something lined up, you freak out and you panic and you think, oh my gosh, what if I, but this time I intentionally went into things mm -hmm. knowing I was going to take a reprieve for a little bit. And because of that, now I am tapping into my growth mindset <laughs> and just finally exploring something I've always wanted to do. Um, and graphic novels have always been sitting there in the back of my brain. And I think for so long, I've had this fixed mindset of, oh, there's so many people that are incredible at graphic novels. I can't do this. And it's almost like I've already set myself up for failure by just stating that from the beginning. Right. And I thought, you know, I'm looking at this as the end goal of a graphic novel versus the journey of just mm -hmm. trying it and exploring it and just tapping into something different. So now I'm reading a bunch of books, I'm taking some classes with my son, and I'm just enjoying the journey and seeing where it goes. Um, I think that's where that's I am. Great. I mean, picture books have had their place and I've done mm -hmm. 15 now, but I could tell that I was starting to get itchy mm -hmm. to just try something different. I can't stay on the same thing for years and i i have lifespans <laughs> right and, and the graphic novel it's not going to be 3d right it's it's not going to no. be cut yeah paper I, I need a break from the 3d um i say that i say that but we know right. what's going to happen um so i think right now it's just really important that i'm practicing just playing resting and letting it go where it needs to go and even if it bombs ultimately and i don't mm -hmm. produce something that it, i've definitely grown and learned something that i can still apply to whatever i return to if i'm returning to picture books i've already noticed i've been paying more attention now to people i've been yeah. going out in public and go, noticing body shapes more and, uh, and things that i wasn't i had forgotten to notice yeah. in my prior project so if anything, it's at least awakening my awareness and observation skills. And I, I have to just look at it as a growth journey right, right now. Right. How's that for a long answer? That's all I got. No, that's super, that's super cool. I'm I think excited. that's an entire pod. We could, we could do an entire <laughs> podcast just on sort of the seasons of our creative right. life. Right. Yeah. yeah I heard a, cool. uh, recently, I don't know what, what you call it. It's like a, a parable or a, you know, a, a, like a symbolic story, but there was this uh, farmer and it had really has to do with this. And he sends, sends his four sons out at different times of the year to go scout out and tell them what the, um, what these particular trees are like and to and return word on what the trees and uh, the trees are like in this particular field far away. Right. And so one son goes out and he comes back and he says, Oh man, it's beautiful. The tree is green. The, the blossoms are all there. You know, the tree is very healthy. It's, it's ready, you know, it's ready to, to produce fruit. The second son comes out in the summer and he's like, I don't know what you're talking about. This, this tree is already producing fruit. Like, like there is fruit dropping off of it. We need to go harvest this thing now. Another son goes out in, in fall and he's like, what are you guys talking about? Like, it's, it's beautiful. It's, it's orange and yellow, but it's not producing anything. And then the fourth one was like, uh, you know what? You guys are all crazy. This tree is dead. Like there's no leaves or anything. It goes out in the winter. And, um, and the point of it is, is that you might, if, if you just keep looking at your life through one perspective 
and only look at it as if it's one season, you're going to think that you might be super productive and life could just go on like this forever, forever. Or you might think things are dead right now and there's no way it's ever going to change. But you have to like really step back and see from the, the father, the farmer's perspective and know it's all a cycle and we're yeah. all going through certain things. So, yeah. yeah. Anyway, <laughs> thanks for letting me uh, tell us. <laughs> Tell a parable in the middle of the uh, podcast. I want to show Which you. Which could also be its own entire podcast where Jake just tells parables yes. and Next. relates it back to art. <laughs> the parable of the bulldog <laughs> and the Englishman. No. Um, okay. This is what I just got back from my printer. Ah. Looks good. This is the robots book. If you can't, if you're not on the YouTube channel, I'm holding up the finished robots book. And the coolest thing about this is um how beautiful these two books go together yeah wow that looks so uh, good robots That's and so spaceships and, and they have that they really soft just, matte touch on it too come yeah, on they're just a, a nice companion wow. books i got this book in the mail and was so relieved because they, they nailed the texture on the cover is the exact same yeah the paperweight's all the same and i was so worried because i used a different printer for both of them um, that they oh, wouldn't did. be able to match the paper and they wouldn't be able to like do it right. And it, it's just, it's just wonderful. I got this back too. And I was like, now I got to do, what's my third one going to be? My whole family's just like, dad, take a break. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good reminder. I need to go fill out my Kickstarter survey. Don't I? Yeah, you do. Yeah. yeah wow. Right. That's so cool. But everything's best in threes anyway, though. Right. I, mean, I know. Two I know. I think, um, yes. I think if I am, am going to do a third one, it, it will, like you're saying, I need to take a break. I need to like breathe for a year probably and then come back to it. And I'll, it'll probably be like the monsters or the the, the beasts of the, the intergalactic yeah. guide to beasts or something like that That's or creatures. Cool. Now, do you find, but either of you, um, I've been curious about myself in terms of some people I've noticed, like in picture book industry for sure, there are the creators that are doing picture books at 20 and then at 50, 60, they're still doing picture books. And I'm starting to wonder if I'm more of a reactive creator mm. where mm. my um, my interest in picture books is starting to shift. And I don't know if it's also part that my kids are now 21 and 19 and I'm not really living that world anymore of right. young kids. And I'm finding myself wanting to do older stuff mm -hmm. and i started and i gave a couple lectures at my son's college about being an illustrator and i found myself just like oh i really love this environment this is really cool i think i'm really <laughs> connecting with these like 20 20 year olds and 19 and i and i found myself excited in a way that i haven't been in a while that i've been kind of sensing that things are whether it's a chapter coming to a close and ready to change to a new direction, but I'm wondering if it's more that I'm reflecting my surroundings versus, and I'm more sensitive to that. I don't, have you, either of you experienced? No, I, I that? totally feel that. Um, I, if you look at what I've done for my career, it is not one thing at all. Yeah. It's like, I'm gonna start a school here and like teach people how to do this. I'm gonna do graphic novels, but I'm also gonna do children's books, but I'm also gonna work in animation, but I'm also gonna do, you know, this, this, that, and the other thing. And there's some days where I'm just like, what if I just painted miniatures? Like that would be <laughs> fun, you know, <laughs> like, yeah. and there's no money in that, but, um, but I totally hear you. And then you look at people like, um, like a Dan Santat or a Peter Brown, and I can't see, well, Peter Brown did do his like robot novels, but like um, they'll they'll do these guys will like do children's books and I can't ever see them not doing children's books. Maybe they'll, you know, step off the, the children's book train and do a graphic novel here, but then they'll always come back to doing children's books. And I think yeah. but like Dan Santa, I could see he has a little bit of variability in his work, especially mm -hmm. with the. Um, graphic memoir novel that he did. Was yeah, that? where things get more personal. Yeah. Um, so I could see that he's playing with that a bit more. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I, I just have always been, and I don't want to pigeon my whole myself, pigeonhole myself into, but I've done picture books for so long. So I should continue picture books and give myself permission of that. Well, creatively, 
you kind of might need to change directions just to freshen things up and yeah. um, and it's okay even if it's a break or it is a change i mean i've gone from like you i started out with furniture design and then i was a ceramicist and then i was an oil painter and <laughs> <laughs> but there's certain consistencies through everything. There's an yeah. line work. There are things that keep showing themselves up in every media, yeah. but I have to change things up just like I have to suddenly move rooms around the house or I, I have think to, it's good. I have to do that to freshen myself and keep creative. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What about you, Anthony? Are you, where are you at? You sort of came to art a little bit later. I know it's later. been a, uh, a, you know, an interest of you over the years mm -hmm. like for a lifelong interest, but yep. really a full-time thing for the last 10 years, maybe. Yeah. Seven, seven, seven years. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting when I, when I quit my job seven years ago, it was just so I could learn how to draw, uh, which is, which is funny. Cause again, when you have a lifelong passion or hobby, which I, I a lot of the questions that we're going to deal with today are a lot about the hobbyist turning into the professional um, but my first two years was honestly just to figure out how to put a shape together. Mm -hmm. And then and then the the uh, the the strong, strong desire to make books uh, and really relate back to my childhood really started to come out. Um, also, in this last couple of years, though, things have shifted a little bit more for me as I really see or have seen an awesome opportunity to build a really creative business alongside the, the publishing industry. Like I, I've always said, I, I want to be able to do just a little bit of everything and I want there yeah. to be that creative ADD. Um, but for me, it's been really important this last few years to really focus on being an independent illustrator uh, and a businessman to be able to 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 make stuff, to to build a foundation for a creative company uh, that I can employ a bunch of people. We can just do really fun, interesting things. And then uh, books will continue to weave their way through or, you know, freelance projects will continue to weave. But um, it, I, you know, I, I guess I go into every year kind of with a theme um, and it goes back to that whole seasons of our lives, you know, idea. But um, this last the this last theme has been pretty consistent for this last probably two to three years mm -hmm. of just really building this business to, to prop up and. Uh, give my oldest son an opportunity to uh, to to help out with it at some point, and mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's a yeah. that's a windy answer, but it's kind of no, where I'm it's at. good, and 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 I do think I for me I tend to have five years seems to be my time span. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Definitely, know it seems like I have five year chunks mm -hmm. where I go go go, and I get pit, like tunnel vision into something, and then by five years suddenly sure. I'm like, I want to try something different, and I think even. Um, for seasoned creators, I think they also go through rebirth moments of needing time to start from scratch and learn mm. something new. So in a way, I'm kind of going through that whole process you've just been through in terms of with this approach to graphic. No, I'm learning and looking at things in a very new mm -hmm. way. And I'm almost like I feel like I'm going to school again and starting over and allowing myself to do that has started to plant some seeds of ideas and things and right um you just kind of have to go with it <laughs> right yeah well that's a good segue to our first question if you guys yeah if you guys want to take it it's uh this one comes in from jeremiah and the subject is taking my hobby seriously and he says hello jake will and lee haha <laughs> jokes on you they're not here today <laughs> sam We've it's got... all about sam right that's right <laughs> sam and anthony <laughs> Uh, he says, I heard you guys talk on an episode about how the business side of art takes much more of your time than the actual making art side. I currently have a non-art job that I enjoy. And I get to put, in, put a few hours into my artwork most days. I wonder if becoming a professional artist is worth it or if just keeping my art a hobby is the way to go. I'd love to hear what you, what you guys think. Much love from Vancouver Island. So what do you guys think? Well, first of all, I want to say, I know you guys talk about insinuating debate in comments. Uh -huh. <laughs> Before we're able to answer this question, there is a debate my husband and I have had for since we've been married about the definition of few. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I have learned that one is one, a couple is two, few is four, and several is seven. This has been a huge debate. Mm. So I would like to know 
the listeners feel about. So for me, when I hear this question, I think a few hours a day, that's four hours a day. That's a lot of time. I think like <laughs> I'm, I'm, a lot can be done in four hours a day. Um, yeah. I don't know. Anthony, why don't you tackle this one first a little bit? I just wanted to be clear. A few is three. It's four. Okay? It's three. <laughs> I'm in the three camp. So this yeah. is where we. How is this three? I don't understand. Is I would say four is a handful. Yeah. And several is five plus. <laughs> <laughs> What's your husband say, Sam? Uh, he says, I just don't make no sense whatsoever. Uh, <laughs> I think he's on the same page. A few is three. It just blows my mind. I don't This understand. is okay. This I is how we farm engagement on the YouTube comment section. Right, uh, right. Audience, you have to answer this question. What do you, how do you define a few? Yeah. Is it how, three, how many is four, or more? Four. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I do, I do appreciate where this, where this person comes from, because again, I came from this world and uh, my situation was a little bit more unique where uh, it, it was my mother passing away was the, was the thing that actually propelled me to quit my day job Mm -hmm. to then take this to go from hobbyist to professional but i but i wouldn't have classified myself as a professional until much much later sort of after it and when i was a hobbyist with a day job i sometimes created an unintentional boundary that i was only going to be a hobbyist and if i didn't have enough time and i didn't um i wasn't going to be able to give myself fully to my art and creativity until i quit my day job and um, sometimes we create, create boundaries to, to protect ourselves from, from certain things. And that was always my boundary, is that I had to quit my job to be able to take my art really seriously. In yeah. retrospect, that's yeah. a bunch of baloney. And it was a, a thing that I was doing to try to, to, try to protect myself a little bit. Um, but I, 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 I love the notion where, where this person's coming from, because it's really tough. It's, it's really tough. Sam, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I was going to say, I think that part of me gets frustrated, not for just for the narrative that seems to be very common in the American culture of in order to, I think, be seen as a professional artist means you have to be someone suffering and working the ground. Like, how often do you hear? I mean, I could hear it with my son's college. I would hear when I went and did a lecture and I would hear them going, oh, man. I slept one hour last night. I was working on my project till like four in the morning. Like, oh, you must be like a real artist because you suffer and you, <laughs> and, and I think maybe because it sounds like this person also does enjoy their day job and in the same time. And I understand this idea of definition of feeling like a professional because I'm only doing this as part of my chunk of the day. And it doesn't mean when people ask me what I do, I don't come across as sounding like I'm a perfect, but I, I think it's okay. What if it is an amazing balance? What if it works really well? And I, I guess I'm just concerned about the definition of what it means to be able to say you're a professional yeah. artist, yeah. because I don't know what this person's day job is. Mm -hmm. And there could be jobs that the job itself is feeding a lot of material <laughs> for the stuff you're working on. Um, I don't know. I guess that's kind of. No, that's good. That's good. I, I I like that you bring up. You know the 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 suffering. You you suffer for your art is like definitely a component of being an artist. Like it does take sacrifice. Oh, absolutely. Um, and and I think uh, that really is the the line between I think a professional and an amateur is um, an amateur does it. I think to scratch an itch or, or for fun or whatever, a professional, I think, shows up regardless of how they feel yeah. to create the art. Um, and they're, they're, they're being driven by something more than just whim or a creative feeling. Yeah. They're being driven because they, they see a vision of what they want to accomplish and they're gonna work on that regardless of the mood that they're in. Um, and so really like a professional is, is not someone who's necessarily getting paid for it, but it's the level of professionalism they're bringing to the, the craft, I would say, is how you define your, yourself as a professional. Jake, you told me the story a long time ago. Did you do Missile Mouse while you were working in animation? I can't remember Correct. how. Yep. So 
I, I think this is a, I think this is a good I think it relates really to that. So I, maybe maybe tell everybody when you created Missile Mouse what your day job was like, and how many hours a day were you putting into Missile Mouse just to get that project done? Right. So I worked at an animation studio. My dream was to be a full time graphic novelist, right, and to make graphic novels full time. Uh, but um, the 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 hiccup there is, you know, you need a pretty long runway. Uh, to take to take off as a graphic novelist to uh, I guess a financial runway because that book isn't going to pay out at a certain time you know in, in uh, it's not going to pay out until a certain time in the future and so for me the day, day job was like the cushion the uh, the safety net until this graphic novel career sort of sort of took off and so I had to um, do it while I worked worked the day job and so Essentially, my day job was nine to six every day at the animation studio. Um, and then I would come home, see the kids, have dinner, you know, hang out for a minute. Uh, and then about eight o'clock, kids would go to bed and I would kiss my wife goodnight. And then I would go down to the basement and work on it until midnight. Sometimes it'd be nine to one. Sometimes it'd be 10 to 2, you know, but, yeah. but for the most part, it was four hours every night I had to work on this thing. And then I would give a good portion of my Saturday to it. And the only way that I could do that was if I absolutely took, a, a, you know, a day off every week. So I just Sundays were like no work, no thinking about work, just family time, just napping and relaxing. And it was sort of like my um, my deal with God was like, I'm going to take I'm going to give Sunday to you. <laughs> Yeah. But you give me everything else yeah. for the rest of the week. And, and I was able to, like, accomplish, uh, yeah, doing two graphic novels back to back year after year for that. And um, and it was intense. And I don't I definitely couldn't do that now as a late 40s uh, in yeah. my late 40s body. Oh, no, no. <laughs> we're, too, we're way body. too old, dude. <laughs> for that we all are yeah that's well, late that, 20s like, early 30s uh yeah, approach yeah, to work yeah. <laughs> oh my yeah no i get that completely and it's hard to really answer this question without knowing a bit more about what his day job mm -hmm. entails how much time yeah. is being spent how much joy is coming from that day job um what his family life situation is how much energy because Sometimes maybe the limited amount of hours produces better work and more quality work. If you feel like you're in a good balanced place, it's just a really hard question to answer because there's so many balls. That yeah, like, I would say this is, you know, I usually get in a good like on a good day. I'll get in four hours of creative, yeah. creative time. That seems yeah. to be my max capacity. Same. Right. Um, and it's OK. And I think it also is different depending on where, like I remember when my boys were really young, I know the difference between my husband and myself was when he wanted to get work done, he could turn his, just turn things off and just focus on work. Mm -hmm. And I think for me as the mom, I was, your brain just never turns off. You're constantly thinking ahead. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, uh, even it took years before the boys sleeping through the night. I remember before I could turn off the brain thinking, oh, they're probably going to get up in a couple hours. They might get up in a few yeah. hours. What if they get up here or when are they going to Did you know, I, I was listening to a neuroscientist this week, listened to an interview, an hour long interview about dopamine and how the brain works and everything. And he brought up that um, something happens in a woman's brain when they have a baby chemically, where there's all this unlocking of neurons where they have like elevated memory, elevated problem solving skills, elevated, like everything goes into hyper mode once they have a yeah. baby. It all goes and into menopause. <laughs> <laughs> Gone. <laughs> just saying. So, okay. So I just thought that was fascinating because yeah. uh, I do not have that. I'm not, I, I did not it. get that when my babies were born. Yeah. No, and, it, and, I, and I'm sure to a lot of listeners out there that have that dynamic that it can cause a lot of friction in terms mm -hmm. of like being on all the time. It, it is, it's like, you're always thinking ahead. And because mm -hmm. of that, when I was in that early stage with the kids being really little, my mental, I was just so exhausted that 
to be able to put in an hour a night was easier said than done. Um, yeah, there's going to be times where you can't and you just don't. And this is totally veering off direction. This is what mm -hmm. happens with me. So I'm already forgetting <laughs> where we were to begin with. But uh, yeah, it's just hard really to know because we don't know a lot more about the situation for this. And, and it could be a wonderful balance that in the end, it grass is always greener that you think that if you had it full time and you had the full day to yourself, that you'll be so much more productive and you'll get you. And in hindsight, you actually might be worse off yeah. have too much free time and then there's the stress and there's the anxiety of needing to be able to bring bring in income and need into so there's a lot at play that i think you just have to factor what balance wise is more important at that moment or um mm -hmm. yeah I, I don't know i also i also think it's probably time that anybody in jeremiah's situation tries to define like what do you feel like what professional success would really mean. Like mm -hmm. for some people, it's making X amount of dollars. It's getting this thing published. It's making a thing or putting it out into the world. That's I think true. you just have to define what your level of success is going to be. And I think as a hobbyist, um, you could probably still attain that. Uh, I anecdotally, I met a, uh, I met this, uh, this great vendor at a Comic-Con and I've seen him a couple of times over the years. He maintains a day job uh, and he is, he's got a really thriving Comic-Con booth. Um, he, he only does a handful of shows uh, a year, <clears throat> but you wouldn't know it. His work is really professional. Mm -hmm. He makes a lot of money uh, at these events. He's got customers left and right. He's got repeat customers year over year. Um, but he just chooses to maintain his day job because that's where the stability, the insurance, the mm -hmm. lifestyle is for his family. And then a handful of weekends a year, which is three. Uh, no, excuse me, is four. Uh, he gets to uh, to go out and go show his stuff off, and he mm -hmm. makes even more money for the family. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And maybe that season of his life will change a little bit once his kids are older and out of the house. Yeah, that does. Absolutely. Things are in waves. Um, yeah. Definitely. Cal Newport says that he's a, he's sort of like a productivity advice type of guy. Um, but he says that money is a neutral indicator of success, right? Or, or of quality, I guess, at times. Mm -hmm. um, essentially, and, and, and there's many reasons to make art. Money's not one of them. But we live in a, in a, a world where you have to pay for things with money. So it is a component to this yes. whole survivability thing. So his point is, um, regardless of, you know, everybody's, whether you're an artist or not, is sort of in this position. Do I keep my day job or do I quit it and go sell kayaks, you know, or do I go and, and, and make big fancy wooden tables? You know, there's, there's all different kinds of people asking. We this just question. learned a lot about Jake's uh, hobbies just yeah. in that last 12 <laughs> seconds, by the way. Imagine my uh, YouTube history. Uh, <laughs> anyways, I, um, uh, I would say though that if if you're hoping to make money from your you know your creative passion you should be making enough money before you quit your day job that it totally makes sense that if you were to stop quitting your day job the the money the income coming from your your creative work could easily um, uh, match it right match the same amount and I would say have six months to a year saved up, you know, just in case uh, jobs don't come through for six months or a year. And, and you can kind of weather that while you get on your feet. That's sort of like my practical financial advice to this to this question. It's you just want to make sure you're not like jumping head first into the deep end and it's really, you know, two feet deep, right? Like Yeah, especially if you're responsible for like a household of, with kids. Right. And, yeah. And, yeah. There's more to it than just, um, yeah. yeah, there's going to be right. a, there's going to be a part two to that, that question that you just posed when we get to Mark's question here in a minute. Mm -hmm. Um, because, uh, there's a couple of different angles that you could take, whether you look for jobs or you make the job. Yourself. Well, should we just go straight to him and then we'll do Malachi's last? Well, I just threw off the entire script then. I'm okay. so like, I don't want to be responsible for that. All right, okay. we'll, we'll, we'll stick to the script. Here we go. <laughs> Next question. 
Uh, this from, comes from Malachi. He, subject line, do I need to go to college? <laughs> and the mm. specific question is, do you have to go to college to make money as an illustrator? I didn't. <laughs> yeah, there's many that haven't. I mean, I look at some for in children's book art. You look at Beatrice, Beatrice Alimagna. I don't know how to I feel horrible if I don't pronounce it correctly, but Beatrice Alimagna and Lucida Sala, who didn't go to art school. But I think it's more than just, oh, it's a tough question. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, I don't think you have to go to art school in order to make money. That's not true, I think, uh, at all. But there are things that can come from, I, I guess mm -hmm. you just have to figure out what you need. My mm -hmm. younger son is going to art school. Uh, he did decide to go. And I think for him, it was more so about, he learns better in person. Mm -hmm. He wanted to be, he wanted to be in that studio setting with yeah. other students working until 2 a.m., 3 a.m. And I know you, if that is something you want, and let's say art school is way too expensive for you, then maybe it's important. Maybe you could do something hybrid where you can take, there's a lot of great courses online. There's some great stuff, but I think then there's also a value of in-person learning that's mm -hmm. really important with community, whether it's going to a local community college and taking a course there or finding an art club locally, somehow where you at least are getting some interaction and in-person working I, I just think it's really crucial for growing as an artist per se. Um, and art school, I think for me in general, there's the big benefit is communication and connection of when you develop a relationship with peers or with faculty that there's connections that can happen from that of, oh, hey, I'll, you do really great. I know that you've been really wanting to do this. I know somebody here or I know somebody here. I want to mm -hmm. connect you with them. And I think that is something that could be harder to attain if you're not putting yourself in an art school setting where you're getting to know the instructors and getting to develop a relationship and gain connections that could help you with future projects or yeah. um, and if that's the case just making sure that you establish something locally or what have you where you are able to develop relationships with people that you could have that component to help you grow in your career I, does that make sense i yeah I, yeah i was gonna just to like jump off of that essentially to uh be a working professional illustrator you need sort of three things you need um a skill set so you got to know how you know to draw things and tell a story and maybe do characters or put those characters in environment. So yeah. you have to have this basic, I would say not just a basic skill set, but you have to excel at this skill set. Number two, you have to be able to show that you can do that. So you need a portfolio. So you have to have 20 to 30 really nice illustrations that show here's the type of work that I make. This is what I can do. And then number three, you have to have uh, a network. You have to have people that you know that are already in the illustration business, people that you know who have come and went from the illustration mm -hmm. business, people who are trying to get into illustration business, like all of those three levels are all people that you need to know because um, one, the people who are trying to get in, they're going to be sort of the cutting edge, the tip of the spear of what is the next wave of what illustration should be, right? and they're the ones experimenting and exploring and pushing against the rules and everything. The people who are already in it, they're the ones who know what the sort of standards are and the established yeah. practices. And the people who have already been it, they're the ones who've like know what has worked and what hasn't and kind of can tell you what you yeah. shouldn't worry about and what you should worry about. And I um, think, um, and I think real quick before I forget, <laughs> yeah. another element too is with the connection comes from the art school or school in general comes the alumni and the mm -hmm. people that have that want to help the next generation of college kids coming up. So that aspect is something that's really beneficial from going to right. school, but you can get that elsewhere. I just think, right. and then it also is dependent on a medium. If you're doing drawing, yeah, it could be a little bit, you can learn a lot from it from online classes, but if you're trying to learn ceramics or trying to learn, I, 
those like you, you don't just mediums. pop up a, uh, a a ceramic studio in your backyard like You're that. Kind of like, <laughs> but but it, but I, so yeah, if art school is financially just way too expensive, or if you're not getting certain funding that allows you to, whatever the situation is, it, maybe it just means combining it with somehow getting some community engagement of getting to know other artists in the community that mm -hmm. you aspire to, that you look up to, um, that can help you with establishing essentially, network. Essentially, art school is an all-in-one package for those three things. Like, you'll, you'll learn the skills, you'll build that network, and you'll have a portfolio when you finish. But you will also pay, <laughs> you know, $100,000 for it, right? Or, yeah. Depending Unless on the art school. Good deal unless you get a good check. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. But I can't compare to I and I can only reflect on really my son's experience because I've also learned that here's another fun fact that I've had do you realize the time from 1939 to 1980 is the same as 1980 to 2021. Ooh. And I think we need to just think about that for a moment. So when I try to say, well back when I went to art school, like as Marcus says, anything you tell me means nothing because you're talking about so right. long ago <laughs> that right. things are how to, yeah, I can't really tell you how things are based on what it was like for me in terms of things have changed so much. Mm -hmm. But I am seeing some things that have stayed the same from when I went to art school versus where he is now. Right. There is a consistency with community and with um, just something about a chance to be able to really play and explore and be around others that are pushing and playing and exploring and feeding your creativity. But you can get that elsewhere. You just have to be very um, proactive about trying yeah, to. Yeah, you have to work to find that. that. You have to yeah. work to well, find that. Yeah, about you can't sit you in your answer. studio at home and go, oh, I want connections, nobody, but nobody knows that you're wanting connections. You know, nobody knows that you're sitting yeah. in your studio, like I need to have some friends that do art. They don't know that you're there. You, you, you need to reach out and do that. And that can be hard to do as well, yeah. so. Yeah, yeah. You know, for me, when, when, when I was in high school, I never thought that art could be a realistic thing. I didn't have, uh, I didn't put enough time, didn't have skill. Uh, so I decided to go to business school, which I knew I would be able to, to take in a billion different directions. Um, if I could go back in time, I would I would not do art school specifically. I would still do business school with an art minor, particularly for that level of play and that creativity in the community and being able to uh, to have the practicality of getting in the studio and doing lots of different things. Uh, my growth would have been exponential had I done something like that, but instead the path that just wasn't sort of the path. Um, you know, some, I, I look at my three kids and, and I think about what things could be like for them in the next handful of years. And, and I think any amount of college or, or extra schooling stuff, um, I, I think is, is so individual to the person. Sometimes you just need a safe landing where you can just, Absolutely. You, you, you can just be for a couple of years mm -hmm. and, you learn how to, and I know it seems ridiculous, but you learn how to do your laundry and go to the grocery store. And it just is how to huge. Be, no, those yeah. are huge. Those are very, and it depends yeah. on the wiring of your children. Yep. And let's just, I'll just say that for us, it was very crucial for yeah. being able to gain independent skills of time management, knowing how to, um, yeah, doing your own laundry, doing, these are things that were crucial to just gaining those life independent skills yeah. and every child is different um some need the structured routine of being uh, held accountable for having courses and classes that are defined based on certain times of day um and yeah. the thriving is needed from that whereas others can thrive without that kind of structured environment or yeah have already the life skills that that's not necessarily as needed for them at the time. Um, an art school question can also be posed on if you are 19, 20 versus if you're that's 40, what I was just gonna say. 45 yep. and you've got a family yep. and you're at home and maybe it isn't the best decision at that time. And you can, things have gotten so much better in terms of access to, to, to education online. And there's a lot of bad classes online. There's a lot of instruction that's not so great so it's just finding the stuff yeah. that's really good but even myself right now i'm taking a class online with my son with will weston 
and just relearning how to draw figures like from a real anatomical perspective that I'd forgotten. And it's just been really fun and I love it. And what's even more so is that it allows for adaptability for and flexibility based on if you've got kids, if you've got a job and you maybe today I can't get to this one class, but I can then check into this class when I have that time. So it it's so dependent on where you are in life at that moment and what your needs yeah. are. If only we knew three dudes who <laughs> owned and operated, ran like an online school. This is where the editor cuts in the, the promo for it. Yeah, right, right. right. Yeah. It's over. <laughs> yeah, I'm just learn. Just com. Just kidding. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it, and that's where too. And even with Jake, you had just put out um, an announcement for comics course, which mm-hmm. I am going to enroll in, I, mm. right? It hasn't started yet because yeah. I want to get learn. I want to learn this stuff and I, who knows where it will take me, but I, I have been so scared for so long, but now I'm like, no, and this is perfect. It's something that is easily accessible to me. I can do this at home and my structure, like it's perfect. So yeah, I mean, mm-hmm. I'll be taking that. So awesome. Be be gentle on me. Yeah, if if you don't know what she's talking about, um, at the end of July, I'm doing a a comics workshop. It's uh, it's a two day workshop, and it's going to take place over two different Saturdays, with a week in the middle for you to go work on something, and then get feedback on it on the on the next Saturday. So, check that out. Um, There's going to be a link to that in the um, in the show notes here for the for the comics workshop but it looks really great thank you uh should we do this last question here yeah okay this comes from mark subject line paralyzed with indecisiveness he (laughs) said that doesn't sound like me (laughs) yeah i know (laughs) (laughs) he says independent art business or artist for hire i listened to a recent podcast where you mentioned the pros and cons of both but i have a follow-up i don't have loads of time to do art so how much is a load of time? What's a load of time? Is that? 6.5 hours. I was going to okay. say six plus. <laughs> yep. <laughs> he says, although I'm a full-time dad with three kids and a wife that works shifts, I may be squeezing an hour or two a day. With Will said that uh, publisher traditional art gigs is an ever-reducing industry. But if I don't have loads of time to build a large following on social me- media, is it a realistic option to go self-published or, or be independent? Is it best for an artist like me to just try and get an old fat, uh, get the old-fashioned gigs, or is that too short-term a road to go to nowhere? Um, I, I said that wrong. Or is that too short-term slash a road to nowhere? <laughs> feel yeah. free to share or look at. There's a lot of slashes in this question. I, I appreciate <laughs> that. Feel free to sh- feel free to share or look at my work and cheers. Uh, so that's from Mark. Yeah, what what does he do? Does he do the? He's got a few hours every day. Four. He, he has two hours. Two hours. Day. So a couple. What, what, oh wait, a what couple. A couple too. Yes. A exactly. couple. Does he put that time into trying to get trying to land gigs, or does he do something independent, like on his own? Now, Anthony, you go ahead because your head is nodding up and down. <laughs> I'm going to go the opposite way. So this. Um, Jake. Here, you Jay, can you can you share Mark's work? And yep. I was going to say this about Jeremiah's work uh, from the earlier question. I think both of these uh, these two have have very professional work, and I've been a big fan. Uh, I I was not introduced to Jeremiah's uh, before, but I, I I follow Mark on Instagram, and I've been following them for quite a while. And I feel like there's some some really really strong work. And I know a lot of these pieces yeah. come from SVS stuff. Uh, and you can see just a heap of growth over this last this last couple of years. Um, I understand the time the time constraint, and I understand sort of the you know, what it's like to be a father to three kids and having a wife who works and and all sorts of stuff. Um, I for me personally, if the if the risk is minimal, I think you can I think you can do a hybrid approach. I think you can look for work, but also build a business at the same time. Um, I think sometimes, again, we create uh, limits or boundaries for what we feel like is our, is our social media time or how much time we can put onto a piece. Um, and I think we maybe have to take a step back and, and, and just do our absolute best 
and an example of that because he, he talks a little bit about social media and uh, and stuff like that. I have a buddy who has built an incredibly uh, just a, a thriving uh, internet art business. And all he did for a very long time was just turn the camera around, talk to the camera in a, re- in a real humanistic way for, for 20, 30 seconds, and then post it online. And that's it. And that, and that was all the time that he put into social media. You do a couple times a day, and he's got an incredible business. And I think sometimes we feel like we have to have these perfectly produced videos or these, these, these great stories that we post. Sometimes just being a person who makes art, who can, who can just throw stuff out there and, and try to do it in an intentional way, I think it can go a really, really long way. Uh, I don't know how the industry is going to change in the next handful of years. I know AI is going to disrupt the entire flow of, of just what it's like to be a human in the next handful of years. And I think whatever advice we give out today might be radically different than advice that we give out in a few years. Um, for me, though, I like to, to have my own company. I like to be able to control my own sort of destiny. I like to be able to, to build people around me that can help me. Um, and I, I like knowing ultimately that this stuff is mine and that if an opportunity comes through, like I had a really great job uh, doing a web comic for a video game company for a year. I was able to take that project because I had built enough of a foundation of my own company and I had enough people around me to, uh, to help make things easier for me. So I, I, think you, I, I think you need to stop being indecisive. I think you need to define what's important to yourself. I think you need to, to look at examples of other people who, uh, who have created success for themselves either by going the published route or the self-published independent route. I think you need to simplify as much as you can and just do the best that you can. And, and I think things will change here in the next year or two. We'll see what happens. Yeah. Well, that's a great answer. And I know, I, and I can't speak based on self-publishing, which another plug for SBS with your self-publishing bro <laughs> coming up. Because is that coming up in the fall for the next? Yeah, in August, we'll in have August. self-publishing pro. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I don't know. I guess for me, if I have too many, like I need to narrow things down to try something first. Otherwise, if I have too many ideas, I go into decision paralysis and I can't do anything. And I think I have to try one route and see how it starts going. And maybe if it doesn't go well, then I try something else. But if let's say his goal, I don't know, maybe his goal ultimately is for a book. And what are the benefits for the limited amount of time you have? Maybe it's worth, okay, maybe I'm just going to take the next six months, five months to see if I can acquire an agent, let's say, and develop my portfolio, reach out, try to see if I can connect with an agent and then work towards like a trade published book. And the only the pluses on that side in terms of it takes away all the stressors of self-marketing, all of that, that I don't know, that comes into self-publishing a book and trying to get an audience and worrying about the social media aspect with trade publishing, let's say, let's say you get an agent and you get a book deal and you get that. And then when that book comes out, that publisher will be sending the books out to the book influencers that are the ones that will put out lists online of here, you should like 10 books about this, 10 books about that. And once that happens, you've then got information on contacts and you start to know who to send your stuff out to for maybe eventually that you do want to do a self-published book where that by the time it gets to that level where you're doing, I'm, a, I'm like babbling right now. Um, no, you're doing great. Um, I'm just thinking if your worry is all about social media and you're trying to put out your own self-published book, but you don't know if you're going to have enough audience to help generate enough activity to sell mm-hmm. your books that maybe the trade publishing route can take a lot of that back work out for you in the beginning and help you develop a library of information of knowing these are those contacts that would be helpful for me. These are for when I do a self-published book, I'm going to send this copy to this person because I know that they're going to do a ton of marketing. And um, yeah, I don't know. It's a... I kind of feel <laughs> like, like I look at Mark's art style and he, he this is like, 
I love seeing those relationships where there's like some indie game company or some indie like uh, RPG publishing company or something like that. And they just find one of these little artists who are, are just phenomenally, phenomenally good. I can't even pronounce that word, but so good, <laughs> uh, but not very well known. And they just c keep getting, uh, giving them work and they sort of build the, like this, um, this uh, um, a following in this body of work, like, I don't know, designing games or designing uh, or doing, you know, uh, playing cards or something like, you know, game cards yeah. or something like that. And I could see him sort of like, you don't need to have a huge social media following. And he's got 16,000 followers. Like that's- Wow, that's that, more than mine. Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> fine. But the, it doesn't matter how many followers you have, it matter who follows you. And so every once in a while, I'll get an email from an art director or a director or somebody, you know, high up in some uh, company that says, I've been a fan of yours for years, and we finally have a project that I think you'd be a good fit for, you know, would yeah. you be interested in this, right? It, it doesn't matter, like, if I had 100 followers or a million followers, it just needed that person to be aware of my aware of my work right yeah and sometimes so, you have to put it out into the universe too like if you if you don't put it out into the universe that you're looking for something you want something mm -hmm. what your goal is not one person's ever going to think to reach out to you because they're right. they it's just not even on the radar but if you just consistently put it out there people and the way the way i put it out there is i make the thing i would be perfect for right that's exactly what i was going to say because i thought depending on what this person's goal is, what his, um, <clears throat> what was, sorry, the name just, cause my screen just went. Mark. Okay. And so depending on what his goal is, uh, like maybe he just writes down a list of things of what I would love to see myself doing and yeah. social media. Yeah. You know how I, my feelings for me right. personally on, <laughs> on it, but it could be something as simple as, Oh gosh, it would be really great to work and do these designs for figures for this one gaming. Maybe I should just put together a, like a sample. Like I think I could do something really great for this company. I'll do a little mock setup of like, I think, um, a project together, how I would approach it. And then just reaching out, doing some research, finding out who those art directors are for that particular company, who this, and just directly reach out. And you never know. I mean, you might as well try and just say like, I, I really love this, what, what you're doing. And I just thought this project was great and this is my take on it. And if you ever, like, I just wanted to share it with you and you mm -hmm. never know what that response is going to be. They might say, oh, this stuff is really great. This might right. be perfect. I, I honestly, there are other ways to go about getting yourself seen by the people that you feel um, it would be really helpful for. Yeah. I want to point uh -huh. out too, like he says, you know, and then we'll, then we'll wrap it up because we're sort of getting the end of our time here. But he says, you know, he only has an hour or two a day to work on it. And if you look at his body of work that he has and the quality that he has. It's there, really good. It's, it's there. Really good. It's really don't, good. Don't sleep on two hours or an hour a day of work. You can get some quality stuff done. If you if you extrapolate that out or, or project that out over a year, that's in the, and you don't work on weekends or anything. That's 300 hours. That's a lot you know? of time. Yeah. That's a lot of time. Yeah. Um, and you can build up a nice body of work with just a, uh, you know, chipping away at it a little bit of time every day. I think yeah. the key there too, though, is every day. Like if yeah. you do five hours a week, but it's all on Saturday, like sometimes that can be you less gotta, effective. You got to show up, man. You got to, you got to yeah. show up day after day after day. And there's that question between an independent art business or an artist for hire. At, after working with you guys on the self-publishing pro and just doing what I do for, for a bunch of years, some people are really wired to be an independent who who beat the drum and tell people what they do. Other people are really well geared to take incoming jobs because it's just easier with your life. I think you have to I think you have to really sort of look at either aisle of like what's your personality type and and what are what are your what are the the restrictions that you have to have for yourself or where your comfort level of comfort is going to be. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that I think is probably one of the first things that I would do is are you comfortable telling people uh, this is my independent business 
this is the stuff that I make. Here, here are the markets that I want to serve, and, and here are the products that I offer with that. And if that's not comfortable, then I think you might have to look to the other thing, which is taking incoming gigs. But then you also have to, outside of the agency that he signed with, um, figure out how to sell yourself to get those projects. Um, because again, the work is really, really solid. Yeah, now it's just really putting, the, putting the, the foundation, or not the foundation, but the, the box around it, I guess. Cool. Yeah, I think absolutely. I agree. Very, very well said. We didn't answer that question. So uh, good luck, Mark. Uh, you're going to be paralyzed until the next episode where you write in. Um, but uh... <laughs> Well, I'll wrap it up. Uh, all right, everybody. Thank you for joining us. SVS Learn is made possible by Three Point Perspective. Actually, re reverse that. Three Point Perspective is sponsored by SVS Learn. We're becoming a great illustrator starts. And your hosts today have been... Samantha Cotterill, Anthony Wheeler, and myself, Jake Parker. Special thanks to our guest hosts today. Uh, let us know in the comments if you if you liked these guys. If we should keep them around, thumbs up. Be nice. Be nice. My my audience. Be nice to me. Really, be <laughs> nice to Sam. You're gonna get some weirdos in the comments right now. I suddenly now. feel like I'm in gym class again with dodgeball against the wall. No, you'll get picked first. <laughs> Trust me. My audience is feral, so you'll get picked first. I'll get picked last. All right. Uh, podcast produced by Daniel Tu. That's Daniel T.U. Special thanks to our keeper of the curriculum, Austin Shirtliff, our show notes wrangler, Lily Howell, our chief operations officer, Lisa Fott, our illustrator, uh, Annalise Black. Now, go draw something. Perfect.